Uh, so what's up, guys? Uh, if you're here visiting with us, we're super excited that you're here. Uh, if you're just returning, it's good to see your faces once again. And if you're tuning in on the live stream, we are so excited that you guys uh, are just with us today. Uh, we miss you. We hope you're doing well. Merry Christmas, everyone. It's a little bit afterwards. Uh, like Alex said, I'm the middle school uh, director here at South. I get to serve on the team. I get to uh, work with some of your crazy middle schoolers, and they are crazy. But it is such uh, a joy to be here, to be in front of you, and to just share what God has put on my heart, um, to get to walk through this passage with you in Romans. Uh, so before we kind of get going, I'm just going to take a little bit of time to pray um, before we get rolling. God, thank you so much for everyone that is here today. Um, God, thank you for the words that you have written, um, for the words that you gave Paul all those uh, centuries ago. And God, I just pray that... Uh, God, you would help me to be eloquent. God, that you would help me to uh, faithfully preach your word, that I would be faithful to the truth of the gospel, that I would be faithful uh, and just encourage uh, those that are here. Um, and God, I, I just pray for those that are here that uh, don't know you or who are struggling uh, in their walk with you. God, would you just encourage them uh, with your words through me? Um, God, I am so humbled to just be standing before these people today. And so, God, thank you uh, for your love. Thank you for your kindness. Uh, and God, would you just speak now in your name? Amen. All right, survey time. So, by a show of hands, how many of you like your good news before your bad news? Anyone? Yeah, this is where you raise your hands, guys. This is interact. It's okay. This is church, yes, but this is a little informal. I work with middle schoolers. You know, there's some interaction there. So, good news before bad news, right? Anyone? Anyone? So, so if I were to say, hey, good news, your airbags worked. <laughs> Most of us see some bad news coming in that statement, right? Most of us are like, hmm. I, there's a story here. There's something going on. Now, most of us, a lot of you didn't raise your hands. It's okay. Uh, most of us would, would rather have the bad news first, right? Most of us, if we're honest, like, I'm going to raise my hand for that. I want my bad news before my good news, because then maybe the good news is just a little bit sweeter. Or maybe it's like, oh, the bad news, and I, I don't want to get, like, all my good news torn down by all the bad news, so we want to get torn down first and then built back up. And that is kind of what we're going to see here in Romans. So if you're a, a bad news, good news person, you're really going to love this, <laughs> hopefully. Uh, and I honestly really love this. Uh, but if you'd like to, uh, just open up your Bibles to Romans 5. Uh, if you don't have a Bible or if you forgot yours, uh, there's some blue Bibles in the back, uh, so you can go grab one of those, open it up. I'd just love it if you would all open and, and really read the text. And by that, I, I want you to just be able to see that this isn't something that I'm just making up. You know, these aren't just my words or, or my thoughts, but this is what the Word of God says. Uh, and I just want you to be able to dwell on the phrases and the richness of God's Word. Uh, and if you don't actually own a Bible, feel free to take one of the ones that's at the back. That is our gift to you guys. Uh, we just want you to know the Word of God. So, open your Bibles. We're in Romans 5, uh, and verses 6 through 11. And before we dive into this passage, I'm just going to unpack a little bit of background about Romans. Uh, so, the book of Romans is written, is a letter, basically. It's written to the church in Rome. Big surprise. <laughs> it's the book of Romans. Uh, so, 
the book of Romans is actually the longest letter written to a church, and it, it's written by the Apostle Paul. And so the Apostle Paul is writing this letter to the Roman church and basically just encouraging them. Uh, he's simply laying out in these chapters the, the goodness of the gospel really clearly and really simply. And so in chapter 1 of Romans, Paul kind of opens up with describing the sinfulness of humanity and God's righteous authority to judge as the creator of the earth. So God has made this little Lego town with the Lego people, and because it's his, because he's created it, he can do what he wants. So he can, you know, change the little Lego heads around if he wants. He can do what he wants because he built it. He created it. So then in chapter 2 and 3, he, Paul brings up kind of this issue of sin, by saying that no one is innocent. You know, we are all guilty of sin and rebellion against God. But he also points out that the Jews, who, the, the Jews kind of thought they were better, that they were special because they were God's chosen people. And so they thought, mm, we're, we're good. Everyone else is sinful. We're fine. But Paul points out, he's like, no, actually, guys, you are more guilty because you were given the law, because you were given the word of God, and you still rebelled. You still sinned. And then in chapter 4, uh, he just brings out this amazing idea uh, that we are now justified. We, we are now made righteous, not through our own works, but through Jesus. And so it's after all of this that Paul begins to kind of explain the results or the benefits of the hope that we now have in Christ. So, humanity has fallen short of God's calling, and that includes everyone. Jews, Gentiles, we're, we're the Gentiles in this case. But because of Jesus, we can now made, be made right before God through faith in his life, death, and resurrection. And so we begin in chapter 5, and, and Paul starts to kind of unwrap the benefits that we have received because of our salvation through Jesus Christ. And, and the first five verses of uh, this chapter, he basically begins to simply state that we have peace, you know, we have hope in Christ through the Spirit of God that has been given to us. That's an amazing thing. So fast forward, we're in verse 6. And Paul is going to continue to lay out kind of these benefits of our faith in Jesus. He's going to continue to lay out these things. Uh, and he's going to talk about these two beautiful gifts that we've been given, uh, these new identities that Christ has given us through his, his death. And these are justification and reconciliation. So if you're a note taker, I got you. Don't worry. <laughs> Justification and reconciliation. That's where we're headed. But, like I said before, bad news, good news. So, before we get there, we're going to talk about, he's going to talk about these three identities that aren't so great. He's going to talk about our identities before and apart from God. And these three identities, note takers, here you go again. Apart from God, one, we are weak. Apart from God, we are sinners. And apart from God, we are enemies of God. So if you like your bad news before your good news, here it is. These are the three identities that Paul calls the Romans to look at alongside the hope of the gospel. The, the gospel, the actual word gospel, means the good news. But in order for good news to be good, it usually comes in the wake of some pretty bad news, right? Uh, like the good news of the Huskers magically making the playoffs next season would come in what we can all agree has been one of the worst seasons of Husker football that we have all had the misfortune to watch. Uh, the good news of us all getting to go like hang out with friends and, and just 
have a, a great celebration together would come in the wake of the terrible news of COVID. You know, it would come in the wake of just all the, the pain and the loneliness that we've been feeling for almost a year now, which is insane. So because of the good news, that, that good news, it, we need good news to invade dark spaces. And so this is the dark space that Paul begins to identify for us. He begins in verse 6. He says, For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. We were weak. Like, did you, did you kind of hear that? Like, while we were still weak. So not only are you not weak right now, but you weren't weak. You, you not only... Yeah, but I, I stumble on my words sometimes. It's fine. While we were weak. So not only are you weak right now, but you were weak before this. You have always been weak. Now, to anyone, either myself, the Roman Christians, or to all of us, we're, we're not really big fans of being weak, are we? we? We like to hide our weaknesses. Sometimes we even try and like dress up our weaknesses by making them seem like not that bad, or, or just by talking about our strengths right after them. Like, do y'all, if you've watched The Office, um, which is just eclectic at this point, uh, we, there's this scene where Michael is in an interview and they ask him, they're like, oh, can you identify a couple weaknesses? You know, what are your main weaknesses? And he says, you know, I work too hard. I care too much. I'm too invested in my job. And he's just taking these weaknesses that we can all see are deep character flaws. And he's like, oh, yeah, you know, they're not that bad. I, I work too hard, you know. I care too much about my job. I'm too invested. And we do that. Like, we are all Michael in this scenario. How, how many of us would, like, if somebody asked us, what's your weakness, would be able to say one of our weaknesses and then not, like, right after that, be like, oh, yeah, but I'm really good at this. You know, I'm, I'm really, just really good at this. You know, I'm terrible at basketball. Always have been. But, man, I can throw a Frisbee. <laughs> like, just laying it out there. So, we don't like being weak. It's, it's easier for us to hide our weaknesses and say everything is fine, even as Christians. You know, we kind of look at ourselves like the Hulk. We're just like, oh, no. Hulk strong, sinner weak. Oh. <laughs> you can laugh at me for that. That's okay. <laughs> I deserve that. <laughs> but we don't like being weak. If somebody brings up a weakness, we immediately kind of get this Hulk mentality of like, no, Hulk strong. But you were weak. Like, while you were weak, Christ died for you. And it's, it's not even a kind of like, oh, you were weak, like, do you even lift, bro? Like, it's this weakness of, you were both physically and spiritually weak. You were powerless to save yourself because you were broken. And broken things cannot fix what is broken. It only breaks itself all the more. Like, think of the sickest you've ever been. Like, you had the flu, maybe COVID, um, maybe some other form of illness. Like, you were probably bedridden, probably had a fever, probably weren't able to do a whole lot or go pretty much anywhere. You were powerless. I, I think of my dad. Uh, so when I was in high school, my dad had double knee replacement surgery, which as you can guess is not fun. So he's got both knee, terrible knees, got them both replaced, and he was bedridden for several months. I mean, it was not pretty. It's the weakest I've ever seen my dad. He, lit he could not get out of bed. He couldn't, you know, do anything. He was weak. Like, he, we, we had to go in and help him. He couldn't even shower himself. Uh, we had to go empty his pee jug for him because he could not physically walk to the bathroom to do that. 
He was weak. And this is the position that Paul is saying we, like you and me, are in. This is where we were. We were in a perilous position. We were powerless to save ourselves. And, and maybe some of you like hear that and nod along. But I bet that deep down, a lot of us don't really believe that we are weak. Like deep down, some of us think, yeah, yeah, oh, I'm weak. I get it, David. I, I get it. But deep down, I don't think, you know, some of us still think, yeah, but I can earn it. Yeah, yeah but I, if I just do this thing, you know, if I just consistently read the Bible, if I do all these things, then somehow, you know, we think that we might tip the scales in our favor. Somehow, if we can just be good enough, if we can do enough good things, if we come to church regularly, that we can tip these scales, so that we can, you know, put God in our debt. And let me just say this, and, and hear me clearly, there are no scales. There is nothing you can do to earn the favor of God. There's nothing you can do to save yourself. You were weak. You are weak. You still are. It doesn't matter if you do enough good things. It still won't be enough. Either Christ has saved you or you are not saved at all. You cannot earn your salvation and you cannot earn the love of God. There is no version of you that's going to be strong enough or perfect enough or Christian enough. You will run yourself ragged. And I can attest to this from personal experience. Not only were we weak, not only were we helpless without Christ, but then Paul kind of begins to lean into our second identity, that we were sinners. So the end of verse 6, Christ died for who? What does it say? Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, verse 7, though perhaps for a good person one would even dare to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I, I love the argument uh, that Paul uses there. You know, you probably wouldn't give your life to save someone that was righteous. You know, someone who was maybe pious. They've done some decent things. Uh, maybe one of our Christian friends that we find, like, slightly annoying. Maybe we would, you know, maybe we wouldn't. But then he takes it further. He says, perhaps for a good person, one would dare die. So like, think of the nicest, like sweetest person, like most empathetic person you've ever met. You know, would you die for them? They've added to your life. They've loved us. You know, it would be hard. You know, it would be hard to give it. But we would probably give our lives, you know, for a good man. But what about a bad person? What about someone who's wronged us? You know, someone who's taken advantage of us, abused us, hurt us. Would we die for them? Probably not. Probably not. Probably wouldn't die for an Iowa fan. I'm sorry. <laughs> Throwing shade at Iowa. It never gets old. Like we, we would be hard-pressed to give up our lives for those people that have wronged us the most. You know, that one person that you probably came to mind where you're just like, oh man, yeah, I would not die for them. Like, they are just the worst in the world. Like, I would never even picture that. But that's us. That is, that is us. We are those people. Like, we are the ungodly. We are the sinners. What, what sin really is, what the word means, is failure. It's our failure to love God and to love others. It's, it's our own wickedness. 
it's not just who uh, we would classify as the really bad people, you know, the murderers, the thieves, the dictators, the evildoers, but it's all of us. We, we're all sinners. Just like being weak, we don't like this identity. You know, we don't like you know, be thinking of ourselves as sinners. We like to cover our sin up. Now, I'm not a liar. I just lie every once in a while. What? <laughs> that makes no sense. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm not that bad. I'm a good person. You know, we make those excuses. Like, we have all at one point probably made those excuses. It wasn't that bad. It's just a little lie. Uh, one of... Uh, one of the most convicting times with regards to this, I, I remember I was talking to uh, one of my mentors, uh, my friend McGill, and uh, I was basically just kind of struggling with some sins at that point in my college career, and I was just like, oh, McGill, like I've just failed in all these ways, and you know, it's probably because you know, I haven't been reading my Bible. I pro- you know, it's probably because I haven't been really praying that much, and he just kind of like, looked at me, and he's like, well, he's like, no, David, he's like, you're not struggling with sin because you're, you haven't been, you know, following God or being, like, super disciplined lately. He's like, you sinned because you're a sinner. Like, you sinned because you're a sinner, not because you just, you know, didn't get around to reading your Bible. And one of my favorite pastors, a Scotsman uh, named Alistair Begg, says kind of something about this. He's like, you don't do sinful acts to make yourself a sinner. You are a sinner, so you do sinful acts. All of us have sinned. We are all sinners. That is our identity. And Paul later on in in chapter 5 is actually going to talk about Adam as the, the one who first rebelled. And he's not just going to say, oh, you know, Adam sinned, but you guys are okay. He's going to say, Adam sinned, and you have gladly joined in the rebellion. We have all gladly given ourselves to sin. It wasn't just Adam's fault. It is ours. Why? Because we are sinful by nature. And, and Paul also goes on to say, he's like, if you don't think you're sinful, you, you actually don't know Jesus. You actually don't know God. Romans 6.15, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. We are all sinners by nature. If you have kids, uh, you know this is true. <laughs> Mom's in the room. I'm looking at you guys. Like You know this is true. Like How many of you have told your kids at one point or another, hey, don't do that. And then they give you that look. <laughs> they give you that look, and you're like, oh, you little sinner. <laughs> <laughs> they give you that look, and you know it, too. You know that look. They, they give it to you, and then they turn around, and they do exactly what you just told them not to. That's sin. Like, that's your, that's your little sinner. It's natural to us. And sometimes when your kids sin, it it leads you to sin. (laughs) Sometimes it's just the last straw, right? Like it's been a long day of just fighting with your kid, wrestling. They're just screaming, crying the whole time. They don't want it. And it's just the last straw. You know, it's just the last. And and you've been resistant, and your kid just starts to look like a football. And you just want to punt them. You just want to punt them. Some, some of you pulled back a little bit there. These are, I don't have kids. You do. <laughs> this is you talking about your kids that I'm picking up on, okay? This isn't me. But sometimes, yeah, they look like, you know, you just want to punt them a little bit. That's your sin. <laughs> that is your sinfulness. You know, you snap, you react harshly to your child. That's us. It's, it's built in. We're all a bunch of sinners. That's what Paul is laying out. He's trying to show the Romans and us the darkness that we were. 
in, that we are in as sinners, so that the gift of salvation is seen to be all the more beautiful. We were weak, we were sinners, and lastly, he says we were enemies of God. So look ahead to verse 10. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now we are reconciled. We shall be saved by his life. That first line, for if while we were enemies. For if while we were enemies, not only were we weak, not only we were, were we caught in our sin, but our sin has made us enemies of God. Our sin is direct rebellion against God. He is our creator. He is our king. And our sin is us trying to rule this kingdom that God has set before us. It's us rebelling against his authority and trying to exercise our own. And to build our own kingdoms, to try and exercise our authority over God's as our creator stands in direct defiance of God. Benedict Arnold uh, is a name that will probably li live in infamy in our country uh, for ages now. And it's uh, Benedict Arnold, if you don't know uh, American history, uh, especially surrounding the Revolutionary War, Benedict Arnold was uh, originally a general uh, in the Revolutionary Army. So he was a big old uh, general in our army, and he actually switched sides. So he started, you know, kind of getting friendly with the British, and they paid him to actually feed them intel on troop movements. Uh, t they were planning to basically take over West Point, which is one of the biggest forts and, and most strategic forts in the U.S. And so they basically were paying Benedict Arnold to do this. And, and then he went so far as not just feeding them intel, but he completely switched sides. So he became a general for the opposition, for the British, and began to lead British soldiers against the very soldiers that he once led. He became an enemy of the United States. And in the same way, our sinfulness and we've established that we've all sinned. Right? Our sinfulness has made us enemies of God. We have become traitors. We have tried to build our own kingdoms and to put other things in the place that God rightly, rightfully deserves as our creator. We've tried to worship other things. We've tried to worship ourselves, thinking somehow we could be good enough that somehow like a better version of you, a more fit, more successful version of you would be able to satisfy you, would be able to take God's place. We've tried to use others to fill the place of God. You know, the, this kind of idea of you complete me. It's nonsense. You try and use your kids, your spouses, your family members to satisfy this angst in your heart, and you end up using them. You end up harming these children that you put so much pressure on. You end up harming your spouse who you look to kind of fulfill these desires in you, and it, it's, it's not going to work. It'll never be enough. We've tried to use things to satisfy us. Food, drink, sex, money, pleasures. We've tried to put all these things in the place of God, but you will never have enough toys. You will never have enough things. Momentary pleasures will always be momentary. And when they're gone, you will feel the emptiness. We've put all these things in the place of God, and so we become addicts, we become gluttons, alcoholics, we become enemies of God. And that is what Paul is telling the Romans. And, and it's true about all of us today. While 
we were weak, while we were sinners, and while we were enemies of God. This is the dark place, dark place we were in. And because we were in a dark place, it makes the light of the gospel all the more beautiful and bright. So let's reread some of these lines. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since, therefore, we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. In verse 10, for if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. So Paul, in these verses, calls us to recognize our new identity in Christ. One, we have been justified. And two, we have been reconciled. So we begin with justified. What does it mean to be justified? I'm glad you guys asked. You're asking the right questions at the right time. The idea of justification is really a central theme in the Bible. It's, it's really important to us. Without justification, there's no good news. Now, we've already established before this that we were guilty. Uh, before God, you know, we stood accused as weak, sinful enemies of God. And Paul says that through the blood of Christ, we have been justified. Now, justified is, is a legal term, and it basically uh, means to be declared innocent, uh, to be declared righteous. So uh, imagine if you were in a courtroom, and you've just watched the, uh, basically them lay out that uh, this person who's on trial is fully guilty, like beyond a shadow of a doubt. You know they're guilty, O.J. Simpson. Like, you know this person is guilty. It's clear to everyone he did it. That's the position that we were in. We, we were guilty. Beyond a shadow of a doubt. And this idea of justification is that God has banged his gavel. Christ has stood up and declared us innocent. We have been declared righteous in the sight of God. That despite our guilt, despite our shame, despite the fact that we, we have indeed sinned, despite the fact that we are indeed enemies of God, we have been declared innocent by the blood of Christ. That's you, that's me who are guilty before God. But Jesus has stood in our place and taken the wrath of God so that we might be declared innocent. And I, the wrath of God, like, imagine that. If, if God's love is infinite, if his love for us is infinite, so is his wrath. His wrath is the most terrible thing you could imagine. Like, in fact, if you look in the Gospels, when it describes Jesus before he takes the cross. He's in the Garden of Gethsemane, literally crying tears of blood as he stares down the wrath of God that we deserved. We've been declared innocent. The wrath of God has been taken for us by Jesus. On the cross, we have been justified before God. You, in your weakness, could not save yourself. You, in your sinfulness, could never be seen as innocent, but God has looked on you with love and has given his life for you. God has banged the, the gavel and declared you innocent. And he, he did that not because you had something to offer him. You know, he... He did that work pro bono. 
There was nothing that you could give him that would entice him. There was nothing about you or about a future version of you that enticed God to make this sacrifice. He did it out of an immense love. And because of this, because you have been justified, you don't have to try and earn God's favor. He has justified you. You don't have to be ruled by guilt and shame because of your sin nature. You have been justified. Amen. And even better than that, we haven't been just been declared innocent. We've been reconciled. So it wasn't just like, oh, hey, I forgive you, but I don't want to talk to you ever again. Like, we've probably had some kind of interaction like that with someone in our life where we were just like, hey, thanks for the apology, you know, I forgive you, but I just, I, don't, I really don't want to, you know, there's been some trust here that's been broken. But that's not what God did. Not only did he declare us innocent, but we have been reconciled to God. And reconciliation basically means the restoration of friendly relations. The restoration of friendly relations. The relationship that was once broken between us and God has been restored. We've been forgiven. We've been given access to God. We've been welcomed back into the family of God with open arms. I, I've had to watch in the past couple years uh, a few friends go through just some really rough uh, relationships with their families, uh, with their fa- parents who have basically disowned them. Uh, they are no longer on speaking terms, and I've had to watch uh, just the pain and the anguish of that broken relationship uh, where I'm watching these parents who want nothing to do with their kids anymore. And it just breaks my heart to see these broken relationships, uh, to see parents who can no longer stand each other, to see parents who can no longer stand their kids or kids who have just walked away and said, I, I want nothing to do with you. Like, it breaks my heart. And I can only imagine like, the tears of joy that my friends would cry if their parents would just set aside their differences and apologize and, and just give them a hug if they reconciled. Think of the prodigal son. Just this parable of uh, this young man who showed his father incredible disrespect who said, I don't want you, I want your money, I want what you can give me, give it to me now, who completely spit on his relationship with his father and then realized his situation too late. He realized his mistake. And despite all of this, he was reconciled to his father. Despite the brokenness of that relationship, his father didn't ignore him or belittle him or hold it against him, but he welcomed him back with joy and open arms. And this is what Christ has done for us. Christ died so that we might be justified and reconciled to God. Though you rebelled, though you committed treason, though you were enemies of God, he has restored you. He demonstrated his love and gave his life so that we might be reconciled to God, so that we might have that relationship. And that was the point all along, from the very beginning of time. The point of the gospel is never that, hey, let's all go to heaven. The point of, not, uh, of the gospel is not heaven for heaven's sake. It was never believe in the gospel so you don't go to hell. That was never the point. The message of the gospel was and always will be that you were sinners caught in rebellion against God, bound for hell because you were enemies of God, because you were sinners, because you were weak. But God saw you 
in your weakness while you were still sinning, while you were rebelling against him, and he had mercy on you. He saw you while you were still a sinner covered in the stench of death and stuck in your sin, and he showed you grace and forgiveness. He showed you love when you deserved nothing but death. He showed you grace upon grace and sent his son to take the incredible and terrifying wrath of God. His own son, part of the Trinity, Jesus, fully man and fully God, bore the wrath of God himself and saved you and reconciled you to himself so that we might be with God. 1 Peter uh, 3.18 says this, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteousness for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. Through Christ, God has changed our identities. We were weak, and now we can boast in Christ. We have been lifted up by the mighty hand of God. We were sinners. Now we're justified. We were enemies, now we're reconciled so that we can be with God. And again, the point of this was never so that we can just go to heaven and be in a good place. Yet heaven is just as good as hell if God isn't there. The point was never, let's all go to heaven. The point is, in the end game of of the gospel always was that we would be with God, that we would walk with him, that we would praise him, to be with the one who loved us while we were weak and sinful and enemies. Amen? And if you are here with us today and you've not surrendered your life to Christ, if you've not accepted him as your savior. Now is the time. <laughs> Wherever you are at in your life, now is as, as good as time as any. There's no need to wait. There, there's no need to be a better version of you. While we were sinners, Christ died for us. God wants you. And nothing, not even your worst failures, could stop him. Not even your greatest rebellions deterred him from sending his son that you might be declared blameless and be with him for the rest of eternity. Give your life to Christ today. Take that step. Don't wait. And Paul wraps up this section in verse 11. And he says, more than that, we be saved, uh, more than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconcili- reconciliation. He says, we rejoice in Christ. We rejoice. When was the last time you rejoiced? When was the last time you worshipped God? And and not just because it was a Sunday. Not just because it was what we, you know, do before and after the sermon. When was the last time you rejoiced and celebrated your salvation in Jesus? When was the last time you talked about the joy and hope you have been given in Christ with, with anyone, even a fellow Christian? And if you're sitting there right now and feeling kind of uncomfortable, good. That's, that's the Spirit of God convicting you. That's not just me. And that's something that I felt like as I read this passage. It wasn't just a, oh yeah, I'm just going to get them right here. It was something that in me, I just looked at myself and I was like, man, when was the last time I rejoiced? You know, it may seem like, yeah, of course, David, you know, it's easy for you. You know, you're in ministry. But let me tell you guys, there are days, there are Sundays, 
Uh, there are weeks and months when I, I don't feel like singing. Um, there are times when I am not up uh, to what God has called me to do. There are times I just don't feel like rejoicing. So hear me when I ask this question. Uh, when I call you out, it's because God has laid this conviction on me first. It's because but his spirit within me has opened my eyes to the goodness of God's grace and the wonder of Christ's love and sacrifice. And I have stepped back and had to say, why am I not rejoicing? Like, how can I not sing? How can I not rejoice and boast in or celebrate the amazing love of Christ? That I, who was once far off, have been reconciled to God through Christ. Uh, I, I remember a few years back, uh, same guy, same mentor, McGill, uh, we were talking, and I was just wrestling through uh, this time of depression um, and sadness, uh, and I really didn't know what to do. Um, so I'm talking to McGill, and he just kind of asked this question. I don't know if you know this, guys, but depression is not a super fun time. But he asked this question. He said, hey, David, uh, when was the last time you rejoiced? You know, when was the last time you, know, you celebrated your salvation? And I had to kind of step back, and I was like, I mean, haven't really. And so he, he asked another question. He said, okay, what's something that you do, that, like some kind of special thing that you would do in celebration? Uh, one of my favorite things in the world is root beer. Um, a good bottled root beer is just my sweet spot. Like, that's where I want to be. So, you know, if you ever want to make me happy, bottled root beer. <laughs> Take notes. <laughs> that's, where, that's where I am. So I was like, oh, yeah, bottled root beer. Like, that's what I would do to, like, celebrate with my friends um, or just have a good time. And so he's like, okay, here's what I want you to do. Go out, buy a bottled root beer, and drink it in celebration of your salvation. You know, drink it and remember what Christ has done for you. And let me be clear, in doing that, it, it didn't cure my depression, but it did build a habit in me, uh, a discipline of rejoicing. You know, it taught me to remember through the celebratory act of drinking a root beer that Christ has rescued me when I was weak, when I was sinner, when I was enemy, it taught me to rejoice. And that is what Paul is calling the Romans and us to do. Rejoice. He's calling us to collectively rejoice. And, and we're going to respond in worship in a second here. Uh, we're going to have an opportunity to praise Jesus. And I'd, I'd like to encourage you guys to sing. Sing loud. Even if it's out of tune, we do not care. Sing loud. Give it all you've got. Rejoice in your reconciliation with God. Rejoice in that restored relationship. Uh, we're going to go home to our families. Some of you have relatives or friends in town for the holidays. Share your testimonies with one another. Boast in Christ and what he has done for you. Have a root beer. I've got some at home waiting in the fridge. I'm ready to go. But boast in Christ. Simply rejoice. Why? Because while we were weak, while we were sinful enemies of God, Christ still died for us. And now we are able to boast in Christ. We have been lifted up by the mighty hand of God. We are justified and set free from the death that sin brings. The wrath that we thoroughly deserved, God has borne. And God is actually inviting us now to be partners in his kingdom work of bringing true life to the world.
And that is the good news that has invaded these dark spaces that we were in. That is the gospel. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for the work that you've done in us. God, thank you that while we were still sinners, while we were your enemies, you sent your son to die for us. You didn't wait for us to figure it out or to get it all together. But God, you rescued us. God, in the midst of these dark spaces, so God, we thank you, we praise you. God, we rejoice that we have been welcomed back into your fold with open arms. God, it's in your name that we pray, that we rejoice now in our salvation.